would structure it. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, may it be music, theater, nightclub, film, or television. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to help them understand their wants and their needs and the pitfalls and the traps they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as our special guest, we have a gentleman, and I call him a gentleman, who wanted to be a cowboy by the age of 10. And when his family moved to Los Angeles, and he was then 13 years old, started to write to all the studios, please give me a job, please give me a job, I want to be a cowboy. Well, the perseverance paid off because he has since become an actor, a stuntman, a stunt coordinator. He has been a member of the Stuntman Association for the last 20 years. You have seen him in uh, pictures like The Abyss, Spaceball, Beastmaster, Friday the 13th, number five, Halloween, two and three, uh, Cat from Outer Space, Midnight Run, Tequila Sunrise, and many, many more. He has dubbed, he has doubled for people like Kurt Russell for the last 20 years. He was doubling Richard Dreyfus in Jaws. His name is Dick Warlock. Hello, Dick. How are you, Lillian? Nice to be here. Thank you. You look so gentle for all the job that you do, for all the dangerous thing that you do. Well, I don't think you need to be rough and ready, but uh, thank you. Gentle, huh? Gentle. Before um, Dick shares his experiences and his expertise with us, I would like to speak to you today about another scam which is rampant in the United States right now. This one has a slightly different twist, and it, it's so serious that it has been publicized in the Hollywood Reporter, in the Variety, in the Los Angeles Times. And I am, even though it was publicized, I think that since I'm on the air, I can warn you young people so that you don't get caught yourself and lose a lot of money. Now, this is the way the scam works. And as I said, it has been now in about seven or eight of the big towns of Los Angeles. And it may be taking place right now in another town, for all we know. There, there is an ad in a newspaper, and a pamphlet is being sent to um, modeling agencies, saying that coming to town in about a month, there will be a picture being made here uh, and they need people for extra work. And they name the name of a big star that is going to be in the picture. So, of course, all the young people think, oh, my God, I'm going to meet that big star. Oh, I'd love to work with him or with her. All right. So on the pamphlet, there is a telephone number which they have to call if they want to be interviewed for extra work. When the young people get the pamphlet, they're so eager that they don't even tell their friends, I'm going to do it. Because maybe their friends will get the job and they won't. Okay? So they call that number, and usually when they call that number, it's a machine saying, we're on location, we will call you back as soon as possible. Leave your phone number, your name, and what you're interested in. And usually, the young people go home and they wait by the phone to see who's going to call them. And usually on a Thursday or a Friday, close to the weekend, listen to this, they get a call from somebody very nice, either a man or a woman, it doesn't matter, who asks them a lot of questions. You're a model. What have you done? Are you doing any acting? Well, of course, the young person who is interested in acting but who has done only print work or modeling we feel a little, fib a little bit and say, I've done this, I've done that. And about 15 minutes into the talk, the other person on the phone say to those young people, you know, you have a very nice voice and you seem to make a lot of sense. I mean, it seems to me that you should be working as an actor. 
maybe I can get you a role, a very small role, but I can get you a role in the picture rather than being an extra. Well, naturally, the young person said, oh, my God, what do I have to do? So the other person on the phone said, do you have, are you with the union? Are you with Screen Actors Guild or with American Federation of Radio and TV Artists? Now, usually the young person said, no, I am not. So the other person on the phone said, oh, it's too bad. It's too bad because you have to have a union card in order to be able to work as somebody who has lines in a picture rather than an extra. The little eager beaver person on the other end said, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get the card? They say, well, you see, if we get you a job, the producer has to pay a fine because there are many other actors who are in the union that could be used. So in order for you to do that, the producer has to pay a fine, which is about one-third of what your dues are with the union, which would be about $390. So the little eager beaver person on the other end said, what if I, what if I mailed the $390? Then the producer wouldn't have to pay the fee, I mean the fine, and uh, I could be in the union. The trap has been set and the bait has been taken. So the other person on the other end of the phone, the supposedly casting director, says, well, yes, we could do that. What actually you could do is send a check to Screen Actors Guild, P.O. Box, something, something, something in Los Angeles. Now, understand that Screen Actors Guild does not have a P.O. Box. They have a big building on Hollywood Boulevard and on some, well, another one on Sunset for Africa. Okay? They don't have a P.O. box. The moment somebody gives you a P.O. box, beware. So, what the young people do is they immediately send their $390, and they're being told that within three or four weeks, just before the movie starts, they will get the union cards. Okay? Now, the young person waits, waits for the mail to arrive. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, the card doesn't arrive. Now, Two things happen. With most of them, they're so ashamed that they have been tricked that they don't report it. They don't tell anybody about it. The only reason we know about it is because one young man was smart enough to then call Screen Actors Guild, not the number that he had been given, and to report what had happened to him. And this is when we discovered that it had been happening in many other cities. The money arrives at a P.O. box, they collect it over the weekend, and they're gone. They're going to another city. So, be aware. Remember, it takes a long time to get your union cards, and you cannot get it through trickeries. Okay, you are forewarned. Now, I would like to go and talk to my guests. Dick, where were you born? By the way, in, in finishing up what you said, forewarned is forearmed, right? Yes. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1940. And whatever made you want to be a cowboy? Well, it wasn't just a cowboy, but, but that was part of it. Uh, playing cowboys and Indians as a kid, you know, and, and having the four seasons back there. You had snow. I used to do wild things. And now, let me start off. I don't... Being a stud person is not being wild and crazy. It's being careful. But when you're a kid, you know, and you're, you're the first guy to go down the big hill and all that kind of stuff, it can seem wild and crazy, and maybe it is. But doing those kinds of things and watching the, te the television shows and the movies, uh, not so much TV, but movies, that's when I decided that I wanted in some way to be connected with the motion picture industry. And the thing that kept coming into my mind was to be a stunt person, do all that wild stuff. So, uh, so your family moved to California when you were 13. Right. Where in California? We came to the South Bay Area. We came into uh, Hawthorne at first, and then we moved around. I, I don't think I ever went to the same school for th two years in a row, three years in a row. We went to Manhattan Beach and Torrance and Lomita and Gardena and... I mean, just everywhere. And finally, I uh, settled up in Burbank for a while, and that's where I met a man named Bill Ward, who uh, 
I was working at a stable, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact. And he wrote, produced, and directed a movie with Marty Robbins. He gave me an opportunity to do a part in the movie in Double Marty and thereby getting into Screen Actors Guild, which is so tough. It's just what you were talking about. You know. Now, I've, I'm going to say a couple of words, and one name I'm going to call is Corriganville. Corriganville. Please explain directly to the young people. Well, Corriganville is a, a, was a ranch, a movie ranch, owned by Ray Crash Corrigan, who was seen in many movies with John Wayne and Alibi Terhune, the Three Musketeer movies. Uh, he had this place, and it was in Simi Valley. Uh, then it changed names. It was called Hope Town. On the weekends, we used to do live shows for anywhere from three to 6,000 people. And I was there for, well, I was persistent, first of all, to get the job to work at Corriganville. I went out there for three weekends in a row and didn't get paid a dime. And it was a 55-mile drive one way from Gardena to Corriganville. And I won't bore you folks that aren't from this area, but it's a long trip. Anyway, I went out there the three weekends in a row and finally got the opportunity to work in one of the live shows. And it didn't take me long before I was starring, more or less, co-starring, I guess, in those shows as Billy the Kid, Billy Clanton, and so on, and, and all of these things. And it was a great training ground for me and something that I thoroughly enjoy and I value it very much. And uh, I miss it, quite frankly. I was out there not long ago after I talked to you the first yes. time and just walked around where it used to be in a lot of memories, a lot of memories. Um, you, I, I would like to, if it's possible right now, I would like to go to pictures and show what this man does, which is rather frightening. This one, however, is not frightening. This one is a picture of you and Kurt Russell, when I think Kurt was about 18 years old. Mm -hmm. That's right. Can you catch this on camera? Uh, you look so young, and Kurt looks so young. <laughs> Can you see this on camera? Can you pick it up? Oh, oh my yeah. God. There is you, mm -hmm. and there is young Kirk. Yep. Now, you, you have doubled him for almost 20 years, have you not? Yes, yes. And the only picture you have not doubled him is in backdraft because you had put on some weight and you yeah. could no longer match. Well, that. I'm about 10 years his senior and it's beginning to show. You know, he's still got the dark hair and the tight chin and the uh, flat belly. Okay. I want to take this one, which is 20 years later, which is still you. That's from Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah. And, uh, God, you, you, you look so much alike. It's unbelievable. Can you catch this one on camera? Look at this. Yeah, I yeah. can see that. Do, do they have to dye your hair black when you do that? Well, his hair is actually dark brown, and, and at that time, I dyed my own hair. Yeah. I In see. fact, my hair started turning gray around the temples when I was about 20. I see. Now, when we talk about doubling people, this is a picture with Henry Morgan, and I defy any of you looking at it on camera to tell me which one is Henry Morgan. Will the real Harry Morgan please stand up? Yes, will the real <laughs> Harry Morgan. Now, <laughs> Harry is on the right or on the left? Well, as you're looking at it, it's on the left. That's Harry is on the left way. and you are on the right. Right. This is amazing. That was a Disney movie called Snowball Express, Crested Butte, Colorado. I see. Now, before women were allowed to, to do stunt work, you doubled women. And in this particular case, you doubled first lady of the stage, which is Ellen Hayes. Will you please take a picture of him as a lady? Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. And that's this. Art Vitarelli, the second unit director from Walt Disney Studios. That's, uh, he's given me some direction there. That's adorable. <laughs> now we're becoming, we're going to the dangerous stuff. This is a picture that's going to be probably difficult to photograph, but it's a picture I from Jaw. Turn it, yeah, like that. From Jaw, you are in a cage with the shark, right? Mm-hmm. And... Doubling for Richard Dreyfus. For Richard Dreyfus. Oh, mm -hmm. my God. 
I'll move it and make it believe that it's <laughs> underwater. Oh, God. Fingerfish. Now, you have to do a lot of scuba diving, don't you? Yeah. And I've utilized it. I, uh, I prepared myself. I, I tried, you know, tried repelling and driving motorcycles. As many things as you can do. It's always good, you know. So I went out and got certified as a diver, and it paid off. I've used it in quite a few shows. Now, this is from Cat from Out of Space. Cat from Out of Space. And you movie. are actually hanging on to a helicopter and transferring to, to a plane, it's right? It's the other way around. It's the other way around? Yeah. Julianne Johnson, a well-known stunt lady in, in the movie business yes. and, a, and a friend of mine, uh, is the lady that's hanging on my back there. And uh, we had just come from the airplane. We'd reached up and grabbed onto the, uh, the strut of the helicopter, and Ooh. the helicopter is now pulling us away. God. Do you get scared, Richard? Uh, it, it, there is a, is a respect, that it, a fear, but you turn it into respect, and uh, I use it, much like an actor would use it, you know, to do what I need to do. Now, this is... Probably a difficult picture. It's you. You have a different face there, and you're crushing. Can you catch this one? You're crushing through a door or a window. Yeah, that was in uh, Halloween Two, and where I played the part of Michael Myers in the uh, uh -huh. in the white mask, and I was chasing Jamie Lee Curtis and walked through a hospital door. Oh, is it made out of glass or is it made of sugar? Uh, it was breakaway glass. It wasn't real. Can you still get hurt, though? Oh, yeah. That'll still cut you. Not as readily as real glass, but... Uh, well, there's another one, again, from that, uh, that helicopter hanging down. Are you wearing a harness there? Actually, we were. Uh, we it, were both wearing harnesses. We were both cabled off to the strut of the helicopter at that time. I see. How high were you? Uh, guessing, I would say, 1,500, 1,800 feet. <laughs> Oh, better for you than for me. <laughs> now, you have had so many fire smash up. Um, and yet I don't have a reputation as being a fireman. Ah, ha, 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 ha. No, Very really. funny. It's, it's, look at this. Now, are you in the car? I'm driving the police car. I've just ran into a facsimile of the Michael Myers character. I'm playing the part of an officer. Uh-huh. And I panic, and I run into the side of a parked van, which explodes on impact. Now, how are you protected when this happened? In that particular shot there, it was, uh, there was no need to have any real protection. Uh, I knew the extent of the, the uh, explosion and was confident in the special effects man, and therefore I knew I didn't need it. So I was inside the car with the windows rolled up, and that's all the protection for that I needed. I am going to show you you young people out there, three incredible pictures of Dick being totally engulfed in flame. Now, there are two of you here, right? Yeah, that's me on the, on the right, and Phil Adams is on the left, another stuntman, and that's from the movie Firestarter. Oh, my God. I have two more which I want to show, which are incredible. You are standing totally engulfed with flame, are you, what are you wearing when, when you do those that thing? Well, it's, it's a, uh, a suit specially designed for this. I, I won't get into, you know, the makeup or the materials of the suit. What about your face? How is your face protected? It's, it's protected, too. It's covered with the same stuff, and I have a bottle uh, of air inside the suit that I can breathe off of. It's oh. a limited supply, but that's how we do that. And this is, this is another one. Right. Another one. You enjoy being, look at this. Well, it's, uh, it's a living. It's what I wanted to do when I Is graduated your from Corriganville. Is that your face in no, the center of it? No, that's a mask that's made up by a special effects makeup artist. He would, he would take an impression of a face. That doesn't happen to be mine. I see. But, uh, but then it's, it's your body. Yeah. Then it's put onto a headpiece, which is pulled over and secured. <sighs> well... We left you at Corriganville, and now we have been in all the movies <laughs> that you have done. Now, when you were in Corriganville, and you worked there for quite a while, yeah. how much were you paid? Well, for the first probably five or six months, I, I mean, I was a junior at this and had no idea what was going on, but I wasn't paid anything. Uh, I would work on for Saturday. Six months? Mm-hmm. 
And then one of the fellows that worked there as a regular, he said, I can teach you how to get on or show you how to get on the payroll. And he showed me how to do it. He says, well, they're in between shows, fall over the hitching rail and fake hitting your head. See what happens. So I did that. And the first person to me was Mr. Corrigan. And I really, uh, God rest his soul, I don't know whether I should be telling the story or not. But <laughs> anyway, he was the first one to me. And he said, son, he said, don't worry about it. You started on payroll this morning. Well, I was, I was underage at the time. So and you were making how much then? Six dollars a day. Six dollars a day. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I understand this is exactly what you make now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's gone up a, a little. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that the young people don't know that. As, um, as a stunt person and as an actor, you're a member of the union. Now, do you get a regular salary as an actor, or do you get also a different salary as a stunt person? Well, we are in the same union. Yes. If I go in to work for you as a stunt coordinator, I would go in on a daily minimum. And it, right now, I think it's 448 uh -huh. a day. If I do anything beyond this, now this is as a stunt person. This yes. isn't as an actor. If I did a two-minute fight routine and we tore this place up, I could go to you as a stunt coordinator, and you would say to me, how much do you want? And if you've budgeted it for $200 adjustment, which yes. is on top of that daily yes. wage, uh, I say, well, how about 175 And you say, well, here's two, or it's negotiable. I that see. price is negotiable. And it can go quite high. There was a fellow on a, on a film that got hung up by his foot from a, a hot air balloon, and he was getting, I think, $1,500 every time they hung him up. And it seems as though the director wanted to see him hung up quite frequently in the background, so he made quite a substantial salary for the day, you know. Could have made like ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Yes, in one that day. it was right in that, right Vicinity? in that ballpark. Yes, Whoa. it was. Yeah. It doesn't happen like that very often, but it can. No. Yeah. Now, you then started working at the studio. Mm -hmm. You got your break. Um, how tough was it to do Jaws? Uh, it wasn't that tough. Jaws. The tough part of Jaws, I think, was what happened afterwards with uh, not getting the credit for doing it. There was a, a, a midget fellow who had been hired to do it, and, mm -hmm. and somehow he didn't do it. I ended up doing it, but he got all the credit. That was harder than the actual job. Really? The job itself was tough. Uh, we were working in a tank down at MGM Studios, and the special effects man couldn't really see me. Now, he's operating the controls, mm -hmm. which are making the shark move and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do all of its things. Uh, Steven Spielberg was around on the other side of the tank, and they could not see each other. And he's telling Whitey, take it up, take it down, open the mouth, close the mouth. And had, it, had the jaws been able to close all the way mm -hmm. on that shark, I probably would be missing a leg today. But fortunately for me, it opened about that far and then closed up, closed about that far and wouldn't close any farther. But so even though it was a fake shock it could have taken your leg oh yes absolutely it was hydraulically operated and my bones oh. are not near as not near as strong oh. as that and it had a metal frame the shark had a metal frame and it would have taken my leg uh, that's the risks that are involved in this business you try to eliminate as many risks as you can that's the name of the game to be able to get up and do it again and fortunately everything played in my favor had the jaws like i say been able to close i might have been in minus leg today Thank God I'm not. Now, you are now a stunt coordinator, second unit director? I've directed some second units. Second unit director, yeah. uh, which means that you take the actors, or the double of the actors, and you direct all the actions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rarely, uh, some of the better known stunt coordinators, or second unit directors, do get to work with the actors. But most directors don't like, they like to direct the actors themselves. Yeah. Now. You, you're still uh, stunt coordinating and you're yes. still doing stunt. Yes. But I understand that you really want to go full-time acting. Yes, I do. I, you know, that was always in the back of my mind somewhere. And my son has become a successful actor. For the last 12 years, he's been in one show and another. And he's given me some encouragement, too. And uh, some of the people that I'm, that I'm meeting have also encouraged me, and I'm, I'm thrilled with that. And that's what I would like to do, you know. You, you have a minute and a half to speak to the young people and tell them what you think. Okay. 
to everybody out there who has any interest, regardless of whether it's in stunt work, uh, makeup, uh, grips, electricians, I, the advice I have for it is be patient because it's going to take time. Rarely does one just walk into it and, and become a big success. Persevere, stay, hang in, don't, don't give up if it's what you really want. Don't give it up because perseverance will pay off. Pay off. I know because I persevered for a long time and I'm not the greatest, but I'm here and I'm making a living and I'm doing what I want to do. And I say to the parents that encourage your kids. If, if they indicate to you that they, regardless of whether it's plumbing or what it is, be supportive of your children because they're going to run into enough obstacles when they get into their chosen field without finding it first at home. So get behind them and support them in any way you can. And believe me, they'll appreciate it. Uh, and be prepared. When you go into something, be prepared for it. Uh, study as much as you can, and I say to the teachers to be helpful if you can, and, and, and be ready. When the opportunity presents itself, be ready for that. And uh, I don't know what else I can say, what I can add to it. Uh, you, you, I have to tell you the quote that you gave me, which I thought was wonderful, which is there's a very short distance between the front door and the back door. Yes, it is. It is. It, when, if you're not prepared, when the door does open for you, and it will, it'll open. If you, if you show the perseverance, the door will open. But it is a short walk from that front door to the back alley. And if you're not ready, there's a lot of people behind you that are ready, and they're going to get the job. We have to wrap up, unfortunately. I would like to thank Dick for sharing his expertise, his experiences, and his danger with us. Thank you. You young people out there, please keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Be well. Till next time.